be boring, but his guests aren't. It's Al's Boring Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, live and direct from New York. Oh, hi there. It's Al Dukes, and my guest on the podcast today is Tim Sabian, who you will know from his many years in the broadcast world, uh, most recently at the Sirius XM, where he ran the Howard Stern channels and other uh, entertainment and talk channels over there. He worked at our CBS uh, cluster in uh, Philadelphia for uh, CBS Infinity for many, many years, including WISP. You did some time at K-Rock, right? Absolutely. And uh, the Eagles radio network. Yeah. You've done it all, Tim. I have done it all. Between- Were you... I'm sorry, I've already cut you off for one <laughs> sentence into this. No, I've done it all. I started at a very uh, early age of about, uh, you know, I think one year old, you know, when I started in the industry. So, Oh, one. Yeah. So I, so were you a guy who wanted to be a DJ when you were a kid? Like were you um, a radio guy? I, I grew up in the business. My father uh, was a disc jockey at KDWB in Minneapolis and uh, was the program director there and became the general manager there and so forth and so on. And, uh, and I uh, just... It was such a big part of my life. I, I really knew nothing else other than radio, uh, because when I would get out of school in the afternoon, uh, I would take a cab and go out to visit my dad at the office because I was so intrigued and, and so fascinated by the people that were in the industry. Um, and I would just sit, I remember sitting outside the uh, control room window and just looking at the guy on the air, just watching him, just staring at him and just seeing what he was doing. And, you know, here's this guy in a room by himself laughing and having a great time, it appeared to be. And, and I thought, boy, this is the kind of business that I want to be in. This is uh, where it's fun. And uh, I just grew up in it. I was around it all my life. And uh, everybody accused me of working at these great radio stations, which I I did. I worked at great brands. Uh, And uh, so a guy by the name of Mark Morgan from Cox Broadcasting called me uh, in Chicago. They just bought a property, uh, uh, WCKG in Chicago, and it was 19th in the market. They had a 1.9 share. Uh, It was just death. And I cut a deal that uh uh was you know paid me a decent amount of money uh and uh but it was you know I had a, a bonus plan if I hit a certain amount and I think the company thought at the time if they hit a 25 or maybe you know anywhere in that area from a 19 they would be you know in fat city so the station was losing 2 million dollars a year and blah 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 I get in there the station goes to a 48 we're number 4 in Chicago another 48 you know that was my number so uh we are fourth in Chicago ranked fourth overall in Chicago with a classic rock station no big morning show against the morning show that I hired Jonathan Brandmeier Steve Dahl this mega lineup you know of, of powerful powerful uh talent and uh, we beat them overall it was just amazing doing what uh, classic rock. But what, what what did you do there that they weren't doing previously that, that, that uh, it changed was just, it? it? We tightened up the playlist, focused the music. Uh, the branding was, you know, spot on, uh, you know, focused all the jocks where we were saying the same things at the same time, you know, the right things at the right time. Very active uh, promotionally, you know, out in the streets, shaking hands, slapping backs, kissing babies, being a great local radio station, providing great local content. Uh, and that's what we focused on. And it was a good group of people. We were like the little train that could. It was a team, and people, we depended upon each other. We, you know, liked each other. We helped each other. We had each other's back. It was it was really a band of brothers, and we made it happen. And I took people, one of the the women, uh, Debbie, uh, uh, I forget her last name, but she worked, she was at the lingerie counter at uh, Neiman Marcus in Chicago, and she was part-time there, and she had a very, very good voice. And and I put her on full time. She had no prior radio experience whatsoever, but because she had the will to win and the ability to follow direction and the commitment to excellence, we were able to to do very good things. So, so you think radio stations do better when everything's tightened up as far as the music playlists and that sort of thing? Because the, the complaint people always have with the radios is, oh, it's same the music. same song over See, and over. People again. don't get tired of hearing their favorite songs over and over again. They get tired of hearing bad songs over and over again. You know, there's an art form to it. There's an art form to you know no knowing when to hold and when to fold and when to rotate things or, you know, it's a constant uh, management, you know, of, of the music library. You just can't, you know, let it, you know, create it, build it and let it be static. That's when you become, you know, when you get in trouble. Uh, so, and that's where those perceptions come from. Uh, so, you know, it, it, there's an art form to it. But how do you do it with a station that is a, 
that's not adding new music. So they're, they're always like the classic rock stations. You only have certain music to pull from. Well, you constantly are, are testing the music with your audience. You so know. you'll look for, like, even in a classic rock station, a Zeppelin song you haven't played. Exactly. You're that always people looking. Will know. You're always looking. You're always, always looking. Good programmers never sleep, you know, because you're there to put a party on every single day of your life, you know, and that's how I looked at it. As I'm going in today, and I used to tell my people, I used to ask them up and down the halls, what did you do today to advance our, you know, your career or our business? And they look at me with this blank stare. And I go, go find something because we have to do something today in order for us to come back tomorrow. And you've got to get out and do something every single day, some new idea, new twist, new turn, whatever it is, you know, look, talk to your friends. I, and I would tell my production people when they come up dry, I go to Barnes and Noble and start looking through the, you know, the magazines and look at the ads and see what they're saying and, and, or, or go to a, a MoMA and go to the art, you know, to uh, an art gallery and look at art. It promotes, you know, look at the different colors. It promotes thought. It, you know, get out and, and experience something different so you can come back and, you know, create a different promo, a different way. If we did it this way, let's do it 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Let's, you know, do different techniques. Let's look at movies. Let's look at what's on television. Let's look at, see different techniques out there. And whatever, you know, radio does, let's do on radio stuff. Let's, let's get the people's attention. You know, silence is golden. You know, like a, a second or two of silence in a promo, just like, what, what happened? You know, it's, it's so little techniques that just make it sound unique and different and make it come alive. And, and writing is so important. That's one of the, the, I think the biggest opportunities in radio and media is these writers. You know, if I would hire more writers or, or people that are creative in order to, to create and more interesting stuff, because it becomes, this is, that was, and here it is. Uh, I'd rather, you know, see something that, you know, paints a mind picture because that's the beauty about audio entertainment that I love so much is the fact that it's different for you as it is for me when I hear something, you know, a cool blue river, you know, what does that look like to you? What does that look like to me? It's different, you know, so that's the beauty about radio. So, and how long do you do this in Chicago? Uh, I was at WCKG for four years, and uh, I left there. They wanted to change my deal because it was a pretty rich deal. And uh, then I went to go work for Mel Carmazan in, in Philadelphia, and it was the beginning of the rest of my life. So um, you go to uh, what station in Philly? I went to WYSP in and, Philadelphia. And what were they doing at the time that they was, needed your help? It was classic rock, and it was Howard Stern just started uh, on, on the on the channel, on the so station. So this is uh, what year then? Early uh, 90s? Uh, 1990. 1990, 91, 1990. Okay. Um, and, uh, so I got, I got in there and tightened up the music and cleaned it up and, f- uh, focused the, the branding and so forth. And, uh, the station went to number one. We, so H- Howard was already, uh, established there? He no, was he was, yet. he was, no, was De- uh, DeBella was still beating him. Oh, right. Uh, DeBella. Yeah. John DeBella was still uh, beating him. Uh, and WYSP never, ever, ever beat uh, WMMR. In our first book, we beat WMMR 2554 adults. Uh, and then after that, then we beat him, uh, the second book that I was there, we beat them all across the board. And then uh, we got the Philadelphia Eagles, and we went to number one. We were number one in the market. The first time in the United States of America that a classic rock radio station went to number one in, in a major top ten market. Now, when you were going there and Howard was going to be your morning man, they, the, the criticism early on of that was that uh, a, a New York morning show wouldn't do well in other parts of the country. So in Philadelphia, you needed a local Philadelphia show like John DeBella. So when you were going there... Were you concerned about that, or, or were you a fan of Howard already and knew what that show was all about? I, I was a fan of Howard, uh, and I knew you know the power that that show had. And I, one of the issues is, is that I saw an opportunity where it wasn't being integrated into the rest of the station. You know, I I looked at it. I thought, you know, it's there's a saying that winners pick their shots, losers shoot at anything. I any time I went into a situation, I would always ask myself, can I make it better? And if I can't make it better, like going into Z100, what are you going to do to Z100? You know, it's there, you know, or it's, I mean, it's, you know, marketing or there's things above and beyond. You know, how do you make that station sound any better? It's a very well-programmed radio station. I would look at stations where I could physically, I knew that I could do a cause and effect. I didn't know what that equated into ratings, but I knew that I could make a difference. I knew the variables of Howard was a powerful morning show. Uh, I knew that, you know, the format was a very powerful format if done correctly. Uh, And Philadelphia, to me, was a very... Uh, easy market in my mind because it wasn't as over-radioed as Los Angeles or Chicago was. Uh, So I thought, you know, this is going to be 
fun. And now, now, would you work with Howard on a regular basis, or or was he sort of he did his own thing, and you guys just had to sort of integrate it into WISP? Uh, when I first started at WISP, I went up and I met with Howard, and uh, you know, just so he knew who I was and I knew who he was, and and I spent every wakening moment listening to his show uh, and integrating my my you know thought process into what he does and how can I take advantage of this on my radio station. Uh, we didn't work side by side you know, as far as, you know, communicating every single day, but we talked along the way and I talked to us, you know, to Gary and to, you know, the people on the show. So we, you know, had contact back and forth. Uh, But uh, my job was getting, you know, the station, the local station up to speed, the local marketing up to speed, uh, the local branding up to speed, getting my staff in line and making sure that they're focused. And, you know, we embrace this and uh, all of a sudden it started to take off. Then I started to work a little bit more with Howard. And after I took WISP to number one, then, uh, uh, you know, I went to work. Uh, I had dual uh, ownership of both K Rock in New York and of WISP, so I did double duty back and forth. And um, then how's the, that? How's doing that? It was awesome. It was awesome. It was like chess on two levels. And uh, for me, as a radio freak, you know, I just, I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and uh, the the thing that was frustrating was at that time. Uh, they put Grease Man on at night. Which, on K-Rock. On K-Rock and also on WISP. Oh, really? Destroyed my number one radio station in Philadelphia. And because the flow of the music and so forth. But, you know, I, I look back at it. The thought was the... Uh, the thought was good, but uh, the execution or the he was the wrong guy. Now, who know? liked the Grease Man? Was that Mel's decision? Did Tom love the Grease Man? Tom and uh, Ken Stevens both loved the Grease Man. So they they knew him from well. well Ken Stevens was based in uh, Washington, right? Where he was, uh, he was based in Washington, but he, the he ran WJFK and. Uh, WISP. He and the, was the GM of both of those. And the Grease Man was very popular in Washington. Exactly. So we thought, well, why, why wouldn't it work in uh, New York and Philly? Right, right. Now, Howard didn't like that, right? He didn't like uh, guys didn't like that either. coming in and, <laughs> you know, like that either. <laughs> no. So that sort of get, just gets handed to you. you no yeah, one says. Yeah, so, and, and Mel and I would argue about it and this and that, and, and, and finally, you know, it, it just got to the Do point. Do you see an immediate impact? Like that, the Grease Man's changed oh, your was, radio station. Was, yeah, oh, <laughs> it destroyed me. I went. I remember going home and listening to it that night. At, I'm like, oh, you're in it trouble. Just, it just hurt. It just hurt. You know, it, it's because once again, radio stations are ecosystems, and uh, you know, the the principle of putting a morning show on at night and and that you'll have more inventory to sell and at higher rates and so forth. All well and good, but you know, the wrong. It was the wrong piece to the puzzle. So how long does the Grease Man last on your radio station, WISP? Mel is a man of his word and honors his contracts, and, and his word is his bond, and uh, and he honored the contract. I think it was about three years, um, and uh, Mel sat me down one day after I, I I would beg him. I said, please, can we take him off? Please, can we take it? He goes, do you want me to rip up your stock options? No. <laughs> he goes, then why would I rip up his contract? And I go, Gotcha. All right, and then he asked me one day, he finally said to me, he says, Tim, just do me a favor. Just do me a favor. He says, help me get through this. Do the best you can in order to get through this. And we did. And and then uh, I was the guy that told Greaseman that uh, we're taking him off the air at the end of his contract. So. Contract is up, time to go. Yeah, bing, bing, <laughs> later. So, and, uh, but anyway, it was, you know, looking back, I, I just learned so much, you know, because Mel was a guy that was, you know, allowed his people to, to make, you know, mistakes or take chances, calculated risks. And that's why the company was as successful as it was. Um, you know, looking back at it, I wish I ha- could do it all over again. I would have taken Howard and just put Howard on middays, afternoons, nights, and repeat the show like we did at Sirius XM. Right, just rerun it all day it, it, long. Exactly, exactly. It was it was an incredible, you know, powerful content and that uh, people want because when you understand usage – you know, Cume comes to the station, listeners come to the station, but they're not listening for four hours at a time. They listen for 20, 30 minutes, and then they go and do about their business. Uh, but if I would have had Howard on 24-7 with a news department uh, filling in the blanks and, and between the breaks and so forth, and, and I would have been able to take that national, live and nationwide, and, and that would have been just a behemoth, and it would have probably changed history. And do you remember what year the Grease Man ended and, and you went back to all music after Howard? Yes, yes. Then we went to an active rock format, and and, uh, uh, and then we did very well after that. Very well. 
I love having new clothes to wear to work and to go out on weekends in, but I hate actually going shopping. I have no interest in going to the mall, trying things on, getting home, realizing they don't fit or they don't look great. Then I got to go back to the mall to return them. No, I've signed up for a new service called Bombfell. Bombfell is an online personal styling service for everyday guys like me. Here's all you have to do. You give Bombfell your height, weight, measurements, and you let them know the places you already like to shop. And what they do is they'll start shipping you clothes. You try them on. The ones you like, you keep. The ones you don't like, you send back for free. You have 10 days to try the clothes on. You keep what you like. You return the rest. It's that simple. There are no other gimmicks. All shipping and returns are free. You simply pay for the clothes that you like. Put your wardrobe on autopilot with Bombfell. That's bomb, B-O-M-B, F-E-L-L, bombfell.com slash boring. It's Al's Boring Podcast with Al Dukes. And then at some point, uh, Opie and Anthony start making some noise at WNEW in New York. Correct. Correct. And uh, at that point, you're just at YSP or in the Philly? I was, I was at WYSP, yeah. I was at YSP and at WCKG in Chicago. I got that station back again. Uh, so I was traveling back. I, would, I did uh, WYSP uh, and WJFK for about a year. And then I did WYSP and, w, and WXRK, K Rock, for about two years. And then I did WYSP and WK Rock in uh, Detroit for a year until we hired a PD. Then I did WYSP and WCKG for about two years. And uh, ONA uh, just came on WNEW, and we're making some noise and really starting to get some ratings. And NEW was really starting to happen. It was with you know the radio chick, and, and she was doing great. And then it would go into Opie and Anthony. And then at night was Ron and Fez. And, and it was a really solid you know lineup there, except they did not have a morning show. They put Scott Farrell on. Uh, which was great, you know, because I love Scotty. He was, uh, you know, he's an electrifying human being. And uh, so the station was starting to happen. And I wanted to put uh, O&A on, on WYSP because if I had Howard in the morning and O&A, O&A on afternoon drive, I got, a you know, a, a, just a behemoth there. But it was weird. Like back then, you know, Howard hated everything that wasn't Howard. Mm-hmm. And uh, Opie and Anthony were sort of making noise in his market. Um, and since YSP was one of Howard's first affiliates, and he would probably argue that he made that radio station. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, does it, When he hears that uh, uh, Opie and Anthony are going to go on on some of his affiliates, uh, is is that a deal that Mel Carmazan does? And, and again, like a grease man saying, hey, you're going to no, put this on, or you it, wanted no, it? No, we wanted it, and Mel did it. Um, you know, he understood it, and um, and I thought it was a way that I could kind of groom or, you know, steer Opie and Anthony uh, from their destructive kind of, you know... Was there any concern with, that, you, that you didn't, that it didn't work with a doing sort of a talk show at night on YSP? Now you're going to do that in the middle of your afternoon? O and A were different. Uh, yeah. You know, if I couldn't have Howard in afternoons or nights and replay him throughout the day, O and A were different were just on fire, just on fire. And, and they, they fit the, the psychographic, the target, they, they fit everything. And, and, and I saw what they were doing in New York because people, you know, when you looked at the, the Arbitron books, you know, they would listen to Howard in morning drive and they would go to O and A and afternoon drive. What if you had those two people on one radio station, it would just be a juggernaut and which it was WYSP became like a television station. It, the rates uh, that we charged for advertising at that time were at an all time high. It was sold out. It was just the right thing at the right time doing the right stuff. And it was absolutely amazing. Amazing. And then I put them on at WCKG uh, in Chicago, uh, and I had them on at night from 6 until 10. And that station was, you know, now Howard came on again. Howard was number one in Chicago. You know, Dahl in Afternoon Drive with Kevin Matthews in Middays. Uh, it was just, and then O&A at night. It was amazing, amazing. I mean, I just had the best of both worlds. I had the greatest job on the planet running these two radio stations. And then I remember getting off the plane one day. It was in the summertime in August, I believe. And I heard where they just had sex in, in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And my heart just stopped. I said, I hope to God they're just saying this and it didn't happen. And uh, it happened. And then they were pulled off the air. And then uh, they were pulled off WCKG and they were pulled off, you know, all the stations. And, and it was just devastating. And I gave up WCKG because I just, 
I, I just couldn't walk in there anymore because I had this whole thing on a roll, and it was just so frustrating. And and it was just uh, for me, it, it was like a, a a baseball bat in the gut. It was just devastating. Now, now that run where, where on YSP where, where Howard in the morning and O and A in the afternoon that wasn't a very long time, was it? Um, I believe it was about almost a year. Yeah, you know, something like that. It, so, so when you, uh, I had sort it was of, one of the greatest years of my life. I'll tell yeah, you that. I sort of cut you off before when you were saying that that you wanted uh, O and A in afternoons at YSP because you thought you could help their destructive behavior. Well, no, it was just the 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 battling back and forth between Howard and and, and you know they thrive. You know, as long as Howard's doing great, they would do great, and I. That's they. They. Were, I think they were starting to realize that. I really do. Uh, and they really had nothing against Howard. They. They. They would just do it. I guess on the air. I. I don't know. You know. Um, uh, and then after a while, it became. Per- there were some things that happened that personally uh, drove a wedge between them. Uh, but uh, I. I really thought that if they felt the success of being with Howard, that it would change that, you know, the whole situation. And I think they started, they really did, you know, they're very smart guys. They're they're and they're good guys. Uh, it's just, they, they needed to feel that success. They wanted it too. They're very competitive. We were, you know, that's how we were brought up in this industry. Very competitive. Could that have worked uh, on the same station in New York? Oh, absolutely. Or did it not make Abs- sense? Absolutely. Absolutely could have worked. Absolutely. Good entertainment's good entertainment. You know, it's like, why does David Letterman work on the West Coast and, and you know, he does a show out of uh, New York? Why does, you know, you know uh, Jimmy Fallon work, uh, you know, in, on the West Coast? It comes out of New York. You know, good entertainment is good entertainment. Jimmy Kimmel does it in L.A. and, and you know, broadcasts around the country. You know, has a following, so good entertainment works. Right. So then, when you get off that plane and you hear the the Sex and St. Pat's, and then they they pull them off the air, um, what are you thinking at that point? Uh, it was just, did, did you think that they would be uh, gone for a long time? I called my boss and just asked what's going on, and he said, "I'll get back to you." And and the next thing you know, everybody's suspended. You know, uh, and it was really a, a a very weird, scary time. You know, because you just didn't know what was what was what? And all of a sudden then O and A are gone, you know, these big brands that we had, these franchises that we had, um, that really differentiated us from everybody else. I mean, no one could touch us, you know, no one could touch us. We had unique unduplicated content that was unbeatable. And, uh, all of a sudden, you know, the world's a new, a new world. Do you think o- Opie and Anthony were being groomed that if, uh, Howard left, uh, infinity at the time, or if Howard decided to retire that those, uh, that, that you could just slide those guys right in? I, I don't think I, I, my opinion is that I think that Mel was just acquiring great content, you know, and wanted a, a, a stable of great, powerful content that was going to, you know, generate an audience that would stick and that he could monetize through advertising. And do you think that the the company uh, paid Opie and Anthony that whole time so that they couldn't go across the street and compete with Howard? Um, do you think they could sure. have been competitive? Abs- abs- absolutely. Why would why would you want to hurt your own franchise? You know, you want to protect you know your franchises as as best you possibly can. You know, so absolutely. At that know. at that time, at the height of Opie and Anthony, if they went on like say Q one hundred four, do you think they would have uh, they could have really competed with Howard or? Yeah, I mean anything competes, you know, with Howard. It's it's you know, but why do you want to do that? No, you know, I'm saying you, if they went if they went sure, to a different it, company, you, you don't want you don't want to allow it. You you want to make sure that you prevent yeah. that from happening. So you know, and Mel was smart enough to have you know contracts that uh, had non competes in them and and prevent uh, you know from them destroying the the mothership. And then uh, for the rest of Howard's run at Infinity CBS, you were still at YSP, correct? Yes, yes. And then um, do you get to start doing the talks with Howard that he's planning on going somewhere else, or do you do you hear that news like everybody else does on the radio that time? I heard it just like everybody else did on the radio. And uh, it was, and then Mel left also the company, and I told my wife at the time, I said, this is it. I'm I'm going to retire. I'm I'm done. But you are know? you now? Where are you? Uh, you're where that morning because you're running YSP. Where are you when you hear that come out of the speakers? That your morning man is leaving the company in my office. Yeah, you know? and how'd that go? <laughs> oh my god! Everybody walks into my office like, "What's <laughs> going on?" And I'm like, "Oh my god!" I just, and I called my boss and uh, at the time and and like, "What? What is go-? you know? Whoa!" Because it was like. You want to talk about, you know, life changing. That's life changing. And because we, we built a franchise around Howard. I mean, Howard was, 
was it. Right. You know? uh, I mean, as you know, everybody, everything, uh, 60% of the revenue that came into the radio station was based on the Howard Stern show. Uh, and the halo effect of Howard, you know, being on in mornings, you know, elevated the rest of the of the station. So, you know, between Howard Stern and Morning Drive and Eagles football on the weekends and, you know, a great music format, I had, you know, the world by the tail. And all of a sudden, you know, my world's walking out the door. Right. So, so here we go. I don't remember, uh, you know, he what was that like a fifteen month uh, period between uh, his announcement and it was about a year and his yeah, contract year, ending. Yes, twelve months, something like that. So how months. how far into that do they make the announcement that you're going to go to Sirius with him? Uh, Howard and Don called me. Don Buckwald, his agent, uh, called me in September, uh, right before uh, he went on. He was leaving uh, uh, CBS. And they said, uh, you know, they get on the phone and, and they say, hey, Tim, it's Howard, it's Don. How you guys doing? What's up? And uh, it, we want to talk to you about, uh, you know, come to uh, to New York with us uh, to Sirius XM. And I said, oh, I said, well, that's going to be interesting because I don't think my wife will ever move, number one. And, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I'll talk to you, but I, I just don't know, you know, if that's going to happen. Um so I went up and talked to him, and I got so jazzed about it and so excited about it because, you know, the things that Howard was saying and Don were saying, and I and, uh, was like, oh, my God, I got to go do that. This is, this is you know, a chance of a lifetime. And uh, even if it's just for five years, I'll do it and, you know, whatever. So I uh, decided to do it. We worked it out and went, and it was the most incredible experience of my life. I worked literally 24 hours a day, I think, you know, I would sleep maybe three, four hours here and there and, and, uh, you know, getting this thing together. Cause I had, uh, I started in October, October, November, December, I had three months to build this thing, uh, to two channels out and, uh, it was intense. It was just intense. We launched on one nine Oh six and it was just incredible. And about a month into it or so I got a call from Howard and uh, he calls up, he says, Tim, I got to tell you something. He says, these channels sound better than I ever, ever, ever imagined. And it made me feel so good and filled me up with such just like a tingle. I just went, oh, my God. It was just all worth it. That call right there was worth every bit of effort and everything that I put into it. So what sort of things, uh, would there just be brainstorming meetings where, like, who who even thinks to do a whole news uh, team to How, cover Howard Stern news. I, I would sit with Howard in the beginning in the first couple of months, and I would just keep asking him questions about this, that, and the other thing. And Howard just generates ideas and thoughts. And this, he is, he is one in a billion, you know, one in a trillion. He has such a, an astute a sensitivity towards his audience, uh, what works for him, what doesn't work for his audience. And he just knows. He just knows. And and talking to him, he just, there's no boundaries. He just lets, there's no bad ideas, just lets things flow. And uh, things happen organically with him. And uh, it's it's really an amazing process. And I'm very, very blessed to have the career that I've had, but also have had the opportunity to work directly with him uh, and Gary uh, over the years. And Don, it was just an absolute amazing, amazing opportunity. And when he left a terrestrial radio, wh- what do you think his audience size was? What was the estimates at the time? They say at the time it was like over 16 million, something like that. 16, and then what were they hoping for? to be successful for a satellite because at that time satellite wasn't what it is now yeah, when howard signed on it was like around seven hundred thousand subscribers to sirius uh radio they weren't merged at the time and when howard signed on uh the the subscriber based jumped to like uh uh three million you know or, you know right away i mean he, he that you could he, say specifically it, oh, came for yeah, that it caused an effect yeah howard Howard was a, a, an incredible force uh, in driving subscribers to Sirius XM and also an incredible force in making the merger happen. You know, if it wasn't for Howard and with Mel Carmazan, that merger would have never have happened, ever. And then what would that have been like if there was no merger? Uh, I think uh, one of the companies would have went uh, bankrupt and, and uh, you know, you, there would be one satellite company or who knows, who knows what would have happened. It was, it was uh, you know, it was really a sticky, sticky time. It was interesting. It seems like over there, there's a lot of uh, good talk shows. They're spread out on so many different places that if you're not a Howard, if you're not like the Howard Stern channel is a go-to channel. So if you have a talk show on there, like when Pharrell was on there or Bubba the Love Sponge was on there, people would find that 
I don't know how they're finding these other shows. They're it's, spread out everywhere. Yeah, one, one of the things uh, with Sirius, there's a lot of great people working at Sirius XM, a lot of great people. And, and I had the opportunity to meet and to work alongside a lot of these people that I really came to admire and love. Uh, but uh, the problem is, is that after Howard, those two channels, those are really defined and, and clear and understanding what they are. And ONA, to a certain degree, is another one of those those channels. Um, uh, but the rest of it is just, uh, like you say, it's a mishmash. And, and I think one of the issues is that uh, they're not radio people running the company. They're, they're, they're not from the world of, of what we're used to and how to create, you know, specific channels and specific brands. And, you know, they do and they don't, you know, there's, there's just an aggregation of, of a bunch of talent. Uh, and uh, that's it. And it's, it's, it's not defined. And then who decides for the Howard channels uh, what other talent you're going to hire, like Pharrell and Bubba? Uh, that was a, a comedy. Howard and I would talk about, you know, how, you know, what his expectations were. What, you know, the goal at the time was is that we wanted to build the Howard channel, of course, you know, Howard 100. And then Howard 101 would be uh, spinoff shows of the Howard Stern world. Because we saw ourselves at some point, you know, if he went and left Sirius XM or decided to do his own thing, that we would have all these brand extensions. You know, we would have, uh, like, uh, you know, we would have Gary and, and uh uh, John Hines show, you know, which was the wrap up show. We had all these, you know, we do things with Riley Martin or we did things with, you know, we created a, a show with uh, Dr. Harry Fish and you know, we, we want, wanted to do something like Love Lines because the difference was that on our platform, you could talk honestly and use real language uh, that you were unable to use on terrestrial radio. So, you know, we developed this thing with uh, Dr. Harry Fish and Shuley and, and all these other shows with Bubba and stuff. So, you know, we started to have a variety of things and create this arsenal of weapons that that would reinforce the brand of Howard, but also offer this vast uh, variety of, of entertainment, of male entertainment. I'm sure the underwear you're wearing right now is probably terrible. If we asked you to strip down to it, you'd be embarrassed. It's time for you to get yourself some new underwear. May I recommend Mack Weldon? And here's the great thing about Mack Weldon. It's an online retailer, which means you don't have to go to the store to buy your underwear. I find it incredibly awkward to bring a package of underwear to the front counter. So I like to get my underwear online, and I'm going nowadays to MacWeldon.com. With them, it's all about the details. The underwear has mesh cool zones, stay-put legs, and a no-roll waistband. The undershirts they have are longer, so they stay tucked in, and the sleeves are cut so they don't bunch up under your shirts. Mack Weldon is confident that you'll love their underwear, but every fit is subjective. So if you don't love it, they'll send you a different size or a refund. No need to send anything back. And check this out. Use promo code BORING, and you get 20% off your entire order. MacWeldon.com. Use promo code BORING for 20% off. The wait is finally over. Baseball season is here at last, and the excitement continues all season long at DraftKings.com, the official daily fantasy partner of Major League Baseball. Daily fantasy means no season-long commitments, just instant cash, instant gratification. Why wait until the end of the season to claim victory when you can win huge cash every day? At DraftKings, it's like a brand new season every time you play. Just select two pitchers and eight position players, stay under the salary cap, and you could be on your way to an enormous payday. Last year, Peter from Colorado won a million bucks at DraftKings in one day just playing fantasy baseball. Hundreds of thousands of fantasy sports fans just like you have already cashed in at DraftKings. Now it's your turn. Hurry to DraftKings.com now and enter promo code BORING to play for free. You could win part of the $300 million in prizes being awarded this season. Use promo code BORING for free entry now at DraftKings.com. DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. It's Al's Boring Podcast. And how did Bubba the Love Sponge thing happen? Because I, I lived in Tampa for quite a while, and, uh -huh. and Bubba used to go after Howard all the time. You know, yeah. he was nasty to him, and, and like I said back then, Howard yeah. hated everybody. So yeah. I, I don't know how it was so so weird. You know, if I, it, had I thought back, you know, ten years of what I used to hear on the radio in Tampa, and now he's talking to Howard on the air it was so bizarre. Yeah, um, uh, that was done. Uh, you know, I think Howard appreciated Bubba's talent. Uh, and understood, you know, because everybody, it's it's all, uh, a lot of guys don't 
they they see what Howard does, but they really don't understand what Howard does or why he does it. And Bubba was a guy that was a good student, and I think he and Howard, you know, talked and worked things out, whatever. I, I wasn't there at that time. That was done prior to when I got there. But Bubba is a, is a really, really good broadcaster and, and a smart guy and, and understood uh, what it's like and the, the honor that it is to be working on the Howard channels because, once again, there's that halo effect. You know, you establish the brand. Uh, uh, it, it's Abe Cannon and his crew. I hired them and, and put them on. There was a podcast, and, uh, you know, they started to, to you know, gr- create some traction and, and to grow. Scott Farrell, you know, was another one. Uh, it was uh, Jay Thomas, you know. All these guys that were on the Howard Stern channels, their brand awareness was heightened because being with Howard. And I think people, when they stop and realize that, that, you know, Howard is real. It's, it's not bullshit. You know, it's not just radio, you know, wars or whatever. It, this guy can make or break your career. And how did Riley Martin end up with the show? And he's been on forever now. Oh, he's fascinating. The guy is fascinating. Uh, he's, uh, He's just an interesting human being. He, you know, there's just enough intelligence there and uh, just enough entertainment there to, to keep you going. It's like watching a car crash. So you never know when he's going to show up sober or straight or whatever. But uh, he, he's an interesting human being, and he believes his own bullshit. Do you think those uh, stations would be as successful if they just re-ran Howard all day long? Or sure. Do, or do you like Abs- that idea of a- Sure. I mean, Howard, Howard, his content is so powerful and so compelling uh, that, uh, you know, initially they were going to just have Howard 100 and just rerun his, you know, his archival material on the other channel. Uh, but we decided that at the time that we wanted to build out a network and, and, uh, so maybe their, their, uh, their goals have changed or their, you know, their tactics changed. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I haven't been there for a year. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it, it, his, his content is powerful on its own. It stands up on its own and so, it'll stand the test of time. It'll be like, I love Lucy. It'll run in uh, repeats for the next umpteen, umpteen years. Right. So how did that whole thing end? It was very mysterious for a listener. Uh, you know, you were a yeah. guy that was on the air quite a bit uh, on the show. Your name came up or they had you on a, a, about silly things, you know, eating donuts and yeah. the, the, the right. toilets and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then just one day it, uh, you were not there. Yeah, well. Uh, well like, I always wonder, uh, as a guy who, you know, as a longtime listener, it always felt like everything, nothing was... Um, Everything was discussed on the air. Yeah, like there was nothing right. hidden. Yeah. But then well, there were certain things like that that just... Well, it was... Uh, I'll be very honest. It got to the point where towards the end, um, Howard brought in a consultant, and it really kind of rocked my world. It, it To do know, what? To, okay. to oversee his personal business and so forth, and it kind of overlapped into my world, and uh, it, it disturbed me to the point where I wasn't sleeping, and I wasn't happy. I was miserable. Uh, and my parents got sick. You know, they both had cancer. My dad had lung cancer, and and um, and my mother, you know, we had to put her in a home. And there's a whole bunch of personal issues that I had to deal with. So I left. I took a leave of absence, and I went to go tend to my parents to sell their house and to put them in a in an apartment, and then finally into assisted living. And so, and I, I thought, you know what? I don't know how much longer I'm going to have my parents. And and I did take time out in some family time and so forth. So and Howard was respectful of that. And and at the time too, I think we both decided. You know what? I did this for long enough, and let's you know let's go our own separate ways, and and which was good because you know I did it for ten years. It was enough. It yeah. was it was enough getting up at four in the morning, uh, and and uh, I was there till I wouldn't get home till eight, nine, ten o'clock at night because I would have dinners at night, uh, and and I was still doing business where everyone else was able to go home or take a nap during the day, and I would try to you know sneak a cat nap in in the green room somewhere here and there, uh, but it was just. It, it ran its course for me, it's, and I wasn't living life. It was not life anymore. And uh, and I own a, a 15 radio stations. My partner and I, Bill Curtis, uh, you know, bought four stations 15 years ago, and uh, and we beat the competition so bad that we bought the the other 11 from Northern Star Broadcasting. So now we own 15 up in Michigan, and uh, they do very well. So I had that going. I had you know Sirius XM going. I you know I, I just it was too much on my plate, and I thought to myself, why do I need this for? And I'm doing everything for Howard, but I'm doing nothing for me. Uh, and I took a leave of absence. I came back, uh, and I, they appointed me uh, head of uh, comedy and, and entertainment for Sirius XM, which was a great run, and uh, they were paying me a lot of money. And from a business standpoint, you know, we don't need to pay a head of comedy and entertainment, you know, the kind of money that we're paying, you know, Tim Sabian. We can, you know, so it's business. And, and so it 
we all parted company, and, and it was very amicable. And honestly, I had enough of radio for a while. Yeah. I've, I've been in it for 47 years of my life, so uh, I, and I'm I'm much happier. I, I enjoy what I do now. I'm uh, I still you know have my radio company, and uh, I got into direct marketing. I'm doing things now with a partner of mine where we buy products like on Shark Tank, and uh, uh, we bought the the Sweep Easy, you know, the broom, and and we bought uh, we have another product that will be announced here. Will be on television. Uh, uh, starting uh, uh, May 9th that you'll see, uh, you know, which is going to revolutionize uh, gardening and so forth. So uh, I got into that world. I saw the kind of numbers and, and what happens in that world. And, and I said, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? <laughs> Did you uh, sense the relationship with Howard changing over the years, like especially the last couple or the last six months or whenever the um, consultant gal came in? Yeah, I, I t- you know, I just, I think I shut down, you know, because I just thought, you know, why am I doing this for? And I, I really came to the realization, you know, there's more to life, you know, than, than this. You get so wrapped into a, a, a weird void where, you know, you think this is the way life is and it's not. There's, you know, and I'm very appreciative to be able to have had the opportunity to work with Howard and I contributed and I worked my ass off for that man. Uh, and I'm very proud of what I did for him and, and for the organization. Uh, but it was time to do something else. You know, it, it just comes a time in life where uh, you've got to change, change. You know, I wanted to reinvent myself. I, I didn't want to be in that environment where I'm getting up at four in the morning and going to bed at nine o'clock and fighting to sleep. I, you know, I, I, living in New York City, you know, trying to sleep, you know, eight hours every night, you know, because you've got to be, oh my God, you've got to be in bed by eight o'clock. You've got to be in bed by nine o'clock and you've got to fall asleep, you know, and then you've got to get up at four o'clock. And, and after a while I was, you know, it was just a struggle. I'm like, why am I doing this? Were you there when uh, the Howard TV disappeared as well? Uh, they, they left right after I left. It was uh, a few months afterwards. So that woman cleaned house over there. I guess, I guess. The efficient, she's of an efficiency. Uh, there, one. there you go. <laughs> um, and then, uh, how much work did you do with Opie and Anthony after Howard when you did? Uh, the, I worked the with channel? I worked with uh, Opie and I worked with Anthony. Uh, you know, on their channel, we you know f- uh, cleaned up the branding on it and cleaned up the channel and and uh, I thought we did a nice job of of you know, what, what it was. And, and then, uh, Anthony had his situation. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, then, you know, Opie had to reinvent himself again. And Opie's a very smart guy. He, he knows uh, what he needs to do and he, he gets it done. Did you, uh, listen to both of their, um, sides of the story when they're fighting Anthony on his podcast and, uh, and uh, Opie and Jim where, uh, Anthony said that they hadn't talked in since like 1998, which I can't believe I was there well, it's, in 2001. It's, they seemed to find. Well, no, it's, it's true. They, they didn't talk personally. They talked when they were in the studio together, yeah. but outside of that, they never talked. Uh, to be honest with you, ever since I left, uh, serious, I don't listen to radio that often. You know, I listen to, you know, the local news on occasion. I'll listen to, uh, you know, when I get in one of my cars, I still have Sirius XM where, because when I bought the car, it's still on. Uh, and I'll listen to Howard here and there or Opie, you know, Opie and Jim. Uh, but I don't spend a lot of time listening to it. I'm mostly on the phone or doing other things. I listen to Tom Likas on his podcast, uh, which, uh, he's got a new app out, which uh, I think is one of the best ra- apps for a radio show right? ever. Yeah, TomLikas.com, or, you know, or Blow Me Up Tom, whatever it is, uh, go and download his app because it really is a good app. You know, broadcasters, if you're looking, if you're a talent, you should look at that app because it's very simplistic, very simple, very easy to operate, and it functions every single time you go to it. So uh, it's it's the way it should be done. I always, I always think like that FM talk format, you know, where Tom Likas was on, mm-hmm. Opie, I really wish that could have worked or should have worked. Oh, it, it does feels work. like it should have it, worked, it, but no one... Uh, let me tell you, uh, yeah. Al, it, that format does work. So and, why don't we do it more? Cause but it, like, I'll tell you why you music, don't do it more. Because music, you can get everywhere. Because of these corporations, they're so fearful of the FCC, and yeah. they're so fearful of these guys, and there aren't good management people out there that really can you know spend the time and wrap their arms around these guys. They require a lot of attention. You know, Big broadcast companies have you know focused on driving top-line revenue instead of investing in product and investing in personnel. They're stripping it down, stripping it down, stripping it down uh, to the most common denominator 
denominator. And uh, they, it, it takes time to work with these people because, you know, Howard Stern is a full-time job. It was my life. Howard, I would get up in the morning. I would think, how can I make Howard's life better today? And I would go to bed thinking, how can I make Howard's life better tomorrow? That's all I thought about. And same thing with any of these guys, with Bubba the Love Sponge, with Steve Dahl, with uh, Jonathan Brandmark. They're a handful. With, with, no, they're just, they're great people. They're great people. They're very talented people. Uh, but they need constant attention because these jobs aren't nine to five jobs. When I would hire people, I would tell them it's a lifestyle. You know, you just landed on the moon. There's no food, shelter, or water. You got to be resourceful. And if you can't be resourceful and you don't know that this is a lifestyle, then you can't do the job because you have to live it 24 seven, which I did. And I just got tired of living it 24 seven. But that format to your point it absolutely works, you know, and if you have the right people managing it, you have the right people on the air, you have the right people surrounding it to service it, it will work because, you know, as now that's why male t- uh, sports stations have done so well because the, the void of, of male talk stations, they're, they're, they're devoid. You know, you don't see them anymore. I wonder, though, do, do young people that are in entertainment, do they want to be on the radio anymore or have we chased them away? I, th- I think uh, no one's developing them, you know, yeah. but I would look at places like Second city. I would look at places like the Growlings in Los Angeles. I would look at, you know, comedy places like that or, or and, and go to the comedy clubs and look at these people uh, and search them out. You've got to look in different places. YouTube is an incredible platform to find talent, you know, uh, and it's all right there. There's numbers that say, you know, state how many views per video, you know, look at these people. Maybe they're not, a, you know, 365 day a year show, but maybe they work for six months. We have to look at it more like television, you know, where they go in eight to 16 week cycle or whatever it may be, you know, and looking at it that way. I, I want good content for today. I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow, but let's get today solved. Is there a, a person, a broadcaster that you came across during your career that you thought, well, th- this person should have been, they were talented enough, they should have been a bigger star, but for timing reasons or they didn't want to move oh or God. something didn't happen? Several. Uh, you know, uh, Jonathan Brandmeier, number one, here's an incredibly talented guy because of the fact that he didn't come to New York. Steve Dahl, another incredibly talented guy, could have really blown out his career, even gotten bigger than what he is if he would have came to New York. Uh, Abe Cannon is another one. You know, here's a guy, an up-and-comer. He's on now with Man Cow doing mornings in Chicago uh, with, you know, I think it's on the loop, uh, and there's an incredibly talented guy. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of incredibly talented people out there, but there has to have, you know, a manager with a vision. Right. You know, where do you want to take this thing? You know, uh, I'm dyslexic, so I think big. I think huge, you know, and if I can't come up with a huge idea, I have a big idea to fall back on, but I always think at what's the end game, and then I go work backwards to think how am I going to get there, you know, where other people think that, you know, the way they th- I think differently, where they think from a starting point, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to step one, step two, step three, step four, I'm already at the end game, and then I have to work backwards, and you have to have somebody that's got a, a vision that what it's going to be like, and, and what do you want it to be, utopia, you know, where are you going to distribute this content, how are you going to, you know, uh, uh, market this content, how are you going to build this content, how are you going to brand it, how you, you know, so... I always wonder if it's better to be a smaller fish in a bigger pond like New York or like how Bubba the Love Sponge is and was in Tampa. That guy could run Tampa, you know, a a great town. All right. I I like being in New York. I like being in Chicago. I like being in Los Angeles. Exactly. If you're going to do it, do it big. Why, you know, why not? You know, you have more resources. You have better people. You have better opportunities. You have, you know, more things coming at you every single day. Give me the top three. Give me the biggest, biggest platform on the planet. And you had a lot to do with, uh, as we talked a little bit earlier about the Eagles radio network. I feel like the play, the play by play, there's so many commercials now. Everything's sponsored in it yeah. because the rights are so expensive, it's right? So expensive, yeah. And, but it's also, uh, that, I think that comes down to management. You know, managing it's like an air traffic controller. You know, you've got to you've got to manage it. You've got to know when when too much is too much. And and when you're sold out, you raise the rates. You right. Know? And if you want to be on. It's, it's there's only so much the audience can tolerate. That's why terrestrial radio, I think, is so bastardized. You know, you can't. It's unlistenable. It's like broadcast television. It's unwatchable. There's too many commercials. I can't watch it. I can't listen to terrestrial radio. It's it's unlistenable. Right. You know, unless there's great powerful talent to to bridge the gap. Gotcha, Tim. I appreciate you coming in. One last question: If you called Howard today, would he? 
take your call. You're Absolutely. friendly, so Absolutely. it's all yeah. good there. Because uh, it was very yeah, mysterious. No, That's no, no, all no. people wanted uh, to know. Oh God, please! I very I mysterious. wish it. Yeah. Now we're all we've been through so much together. Uh, it's like brothers, you know. Brothers argue this, this and that, but you still love each other. We love each other. You know, he had a, a different way of wanting to do things, and that's his prerogative. Uh, and having dinner tonight with his uh, with his agent. So, you know, we're still good friends and still very, you know, once you're in, you're in. Does he know? have another contract in him? Uh, I think that uh, Sirius, my opinion is, um, you know, Howard does, I think Sirius somehow works something out where they still maintain or retain uh, the ability to air his content in some which way, shape, or form. Right. It's just too powerful. Yeah, you could be on a couple days a week. You rerun stuff. You run the old no, it's, stuff. It's perfect. Uh, Howard is Howard can do whatever he wants to do when he wants to do it, and it'll be successful. <laughs> God bless him. Thank you very much, okay. Tim. All right, brother. Thanks. Thanks.